Good morning everyone, uh, my name is Jonas Lehtinen and I'm from Vaadin team and today's presentation is about building iPad applications in Vaadin and basically how to build uh, iPad applications for enterprise especially uh, fully in Java language. So 30 months ago or two and a half years ago something big happened. Basically this device got introduced and it changed a lot and it, you have to remember that just two and a half years and what happened during those two and a half years is huge. So I don't know if you have seen these adoption curves, but this is basically a device that has been adopted faster than any other device in the, in the history of, of technology. So this blue line here is iPhone, and that's pretty fast. But this one is iPad, and these are quarters since the release. So today we are seeing something like 100 million iPads all around the world. And that's dominating the tablet market share. So it, when we're speaking about tablets, we are mostly speaking about iPads. Yep. Do you hear any better now? No? Could you turn up the volume a bit? Anybody know? Excellent. So 100 iPads, 70% uh, of the market share. An interesting statistic from Apple from one year ago was that almost everybody in the enterprise were adopting these iPads. So we are Yeah, isn't any better now? I can use it. Not working. Maybe I should be really, really loud. Any better now? Nope. Is this one working? Yeah. I'm using that one. So, uh, where were we? Uh, in the enterprise. So basically everybody in the enterprise is now trying out iPads. And the question is how do you develop for the iPads? Basically, there is no question whether you should be developing for iPads. That's quite obvious. The enterprise will be asking you to develop for iPads. And the only question is how. And the recommended way is, of course, Xcode. So you should be using Apple toolset for building like the best up iPad applications out there. And that's a way of building like really nice iPad applications. The challenge is that this is like quite heavy tool chain. You should be building things in Objective-C and if you don't have team in place already who can do uh, Objective-C and, and uh, build iOS application in Xcode, that's quite a leap. So the next option is HTML5, and that's actually a really nice environment. So you can build quite rich uh, applications for iPad with HTML5, and basically this is what we are doing today, in a way. But with HTML5, you basically are writing your application in JavaScript. And writing a rich application, especially for a tablet device, handling all those touch events and so forth in JavaScript is not the easiest task that you can imagine. So the real question as we are in Java 1 is could you do or how could you develop with Java for iPad? And of course, the obvious answer here is, is with Vardin, and I'm going to introduce a bit how you could use Vardin for developing for iPads. So a bit about Vardin first. Uh, how many of you have been actually using Vardin? Oh wow, quite a few. So you know that this is actually a Finnish word for female reindeer. <laughs> we come from Finland. The main team is in Finland, and we wanted to have a word that is, is, uh, means something in Finland. And it actually, if you can see the logo itself, it's actually reindeer horns and nose. <laughs> but that's, you can also kind of turn it around and use it as a cursor in, in your terminal. But it, uh, in, in the end of the day, it means just that this is a framework for building rich web applications. And with rich, I mean like something that resembles desktop or mobile experience, not just web pages. So you can kind of turn the logo around and see that this is actually HTML hidden behind Java. So we're kind of making a layer on top of HTML 
with Java APIs, and this is the case also with iPad. We are kind of hiding HTML5 behind Java APIs. So basically, we are building on top of three ideas. So the first one is that there are rich components in Vardin. So you have like uh, around 100 core components for building different kind of applications. Uh, those have been around for a while, so there are basically components for any kind of purpose that you are seeking for. Uh, if you want to see a demo, you go to demovarden.com and you can see a demo of those components there. Uh, then there are mobile components, both for iPads, iPhones, and these actually work also on Android. I don't know if I can say that word in this conference, but they work on Android as well, but they look like iPad and I iOS. <laughs> so basically, on an iPhone, it, you can, when you are saving it as a bookmark on, the, on your uh, home screen, it actually looks pretty much like native application. Uh, but we see the iPad version a bit later. There is also a lot of add-on components. This is open source framework based on Apache license, so there is a really active open source community around it. At the moment, I think we have 283 different plugins for Vardin for kind of add-on components that you can use in your applications. So basically, you go to directory, seek for a component that you want to use, and then look the description, maybe look sc screenshots, how they are looking, how you could use them, and then just download or cut and paste Maven POM definition into your project. And it gets integrated automatically into your project. Uh, there are different themes. These are mostly for the desktop. So this is the basic theme, like for boring business applications, banking, insurance, and such things. These are the kind of main kind of area where Vardin shines. Uh, boring business applications, a lot of data on the screen. Uh, there is also a bit more rich themes. You can also like create your own themes, pick the colors to match your company, or then build like totally uh, customized themes. So you can just put a bit of CSS on top of that, your UI components, and you can make the UI to look like anything you want to. All of these are available as a demos on Vardin.com if you want to try these out. Uh, another set of components is data components. So basically in Vardin, all of the UI components, they have data bindings. And there are three kinds of data bindings. We have containers, items, and properties. It basically means that item is a single thing, like one, uh, sorry, property is a single thing, like one field in, in your object. Item is a collection of those, so it's the object itself. And the container is like set of those items, so it can be like table or tree or whatever kind of uh, set of different uh, entities you want to handle in your application. And the good thing is that these are simple interfaces. You can implement any of these and then bind your own data into UI components. Or you could use any of the existing data binding components. There are actually quite plenty of these, like in memory and JP and SQL and so forth. And these are available in the directory. So if you are looking for a certain data binding, first go to directory and, and see if it's there already. Second thing about Vardin is that it's kind of hybrid between client and the server program model. So if you think about web application, you have normally at least four different layers. You have like the backend server where the data resides and business logic resides. Web server, you do some kind of communication between the client and the server. And then you have your client built with JavaScript. And in case of Google Web Toolkit, you also have Java to JavaScript compiler in between those layers so that you can use Java also on the client side. So in case of Google Web Toolkit, you actually are implementing all these four layers in order to build your application. And you optionally can also write some JavaScript. With Vardin, you actually have to only implement two layers. You are implementing the backend side and you are implementing the UI on the server side. So this is quite different. You basically can skip half of the layers and I can show a bit later how this makes a difference when you're building the application. Not writing half of your application obviously speeds that up. You can also in Vardin write these layers if you want to. As a comparison, uh, in JavaScript frameworks, you are also writing four different layers. In this case, you're writing JavaScript and the communications and then the uh, server side, like some RESTful services, and then the backend layer as well. So let's take a look at the architecture. 
Uh, basically, you could see that in Varden you have to build two parts for your application. You build the backend side. That might be any kind of business logic or persistency or what have you there. And then you build the UI side, but you run that on the web server side. So you run that on real JVM, virtual machine, on your web server. And then you don't do anything in this layer. You don't have to build anything for the client. You don't have to build any communication in between these. It's totally automatic. So interesting part is that you can actually add um, components here on the server side as well. So in most cases, your application is built out of components. You build your custom components, and then you have these add-on components. And these are just Java components, like plain old Java objects that you can use from your user interface. And in the end, it gets deployed as a portlet or servlet. But also, we have a client-side part. We actually have kind of built in the whole Google Web Toolkit into Vardin. So we have the full copy of Google Web Toolkit inside Vardin, and it means that we have a, also a Java to JavaScript compiler in Vardin. So if you need to do something on the client side, like build some new rich visualization there, you are free to do so. Uh, just compile from Java into JavaScript and put it there. And these are still used from your UI on the server side. So these are going to automatically bound together. Then themes, you can add any kind of look and feel on top of these. And the interesting part is you can also do stateless applications, client side applications, offline applications with Vardin. So you could actually skip this part as altogether and only program on the client side. The reason why we prefer to do things on the server side is that you're basically writing only half of the code lines comparing to full stack application where you're building the client side and the service for it and the business logic and the communications. Third thing, uh, we are building everything on top of Java. So it means that basically everything is just plain old Java object. Whatever you can do with plain old Java objects, you can do with Vardin. You can use any saving language. So it means that you can use Scala or Groovy or Ruby to write your applications. In ca this case, your iPad applications. So you could write the full iPad application without, uh, the, just by using your favorite language like Scala. You can use any ID, any tooling available, any libraries available. You are running on the server side, so you can use any of those server side libraries, any of those Java EE libraries directly. Uh, it's supported most, on most Java servers, portals, most clouds, and the license is Apache license, so you can do anything you want to with that. So that's Vardin. And now let's go to the actual topic of the presentation, TouchKit, that is a kind of add-on library built on top of Vardin. So it's actually quite simple thing that adds a layer on top of Vardin. It's three things. First of all, it's a set of UI components. So there are a bunch of components that model the UIs from iOS, like buttons and navigation managers and so forth. Then there is a theme that looks like native application. And third, we have built in offline mode. So if you want to kind of add offline mode for some part of your application, that's also doable with TouchKit. So what kind of application you can build with that? Uh, there is one example application from Puma. It's a product portfolio management application for, for, the, manage, for, the, for the product managers so that they can kind of choose which costumes and, and shoes and so forth they are offering next year. And you can kind of add quite rich layouts and UIs for iPad application this way. And the nice thing here is that all of the data comes from the server side. This is running on the server side. So they have direct access to all those server side services built in Java as well. And they can just show them on the screen without kind of thinking how to get this client and the server side in sync. But let's try to do a bit of development ourselves and, and build one application with Vardin. Let's see if I have connection here still. Nope. Just a second. I'll see 
just a moment. Was land at conferences is always a bit tricky. So let's try it out again. Choosing a local network and trying to connect my iPad. Yes, there we have it. So So there is the application we tried to build today. Uh, did I miss the mic? Is it working any better now? No. Uh, I'm going to need a mic in a, in a while. Uh, so we are trying to code this kind of serum application basically from scratch. And just to demo you the serum application, we have like status part on, on the right here. There are some leads. So we can take a look of the contents of the lead. This is just a mock-up application, so the data is quite random. This is not Finnish language, it's just random, random generated. <laughs> I could have said that it's Finnish language. Uh, so we have also some list of accounts here. We can actually put the really long list, it loads more rows while I'm scrolling. I can choose an account here. And then I can edit the account, let's say, put a new name for it, save it, it gets updated here. I don't want to start roaming. Uh, we have also like contacts and opportunities. So it's like full-fledged application. Uh, interesting side here is that this is actually uh, based on JPA. So we have like, I think, six or so entities in the application. So it, it has a real data layer in there, and actually all of these actions that I did just go back to the data layer and back to the database. What else do we have here? We have some search functionality as well. Let's search for F, and now we have accounts with F. Okay, so this is something that we try to build. So let's switch to this, to Eclipse and see if we can build that application. Great, and we have another mic here. Do you hear me? Excellent. So the application that I was demoing is actually running in my Eclipse right now. So just to kind of show you that it actually is running here, I just, let's say we had this uh, application layout here with uh, two panels, a left and right. Let's comment out the right one, save, and refresh, and now we have only one panel. So you can also run these applications locally, so it makes your development quite a bit smoother. But in order to kind of build this from scratch, let's start by deleting it. It's always a good idea in a, during a demo. So we basically had four views, and I just deleted it. Uh, also, I have this application class right here, full of errors at the moment. So let's delete that as well. <coughs> so just to have some clean starting point and I just add unimplemented method so that I get it compiled like this. So this is the starting point. Let's start coding. Uh, first we need a window. We need kind of some somewhere where we are building our application. So let's create a new touch window. New touch window, like this. We set this our, as our main window, so basically we want to show this window when the user comes in. And what we want to do more, we could actually say add a component, new label, and say hello world. And now we have a new hello world application, I hope. Let's refresh it here. Yes, it's Hello World, and actually I could so that it's still working on iPad. So I reference it here, and we have just created a Hello World application for iPad. So that's a couple of lines of code. Uh, so what's next? We had this view with all those uh, leads. So let's start from that, creating a lead view. 
So in order to do that, what we do first, we set up a navigation manager. So that's a component that navigates between views. Navigation manager. Let's call that left navigation manager, as we have two navigation managers in application. Actually, we could create them both. And then we could just uh, say that our windows will contain the navigation manager. So that right one, like this. So we don't see yet much on the screen. It should be empty. And now we have to start adding views for this navigation manager. So we could say right and set current component new view. So what kind of view we need? We need a status view. But the problem is that we don't have that yet. So let's implement a status view for us. Uh, it should be a navigation view. Like this. So this is the pattern of how you are building one application. You build new components. For the navigation view, what we should be doing, we should be showing those leads, right? So in the constructor, let's create a bit of UI here. Oops, sorry. So what we should be showing, we could actually use a layout called a vertical component group. This comes with the touch kit as well. And we could put this one in the navigation manager. So set content G. Also, we could kind of set the caption for it just to see something on the screen. So let's say this is a leads view, like that. What's missing still? Oh, public, public. If you see any errors, please help, because this is going to be much faster exercise if I get some help. <laughs> So now we have leads view on the, on the screen, but no leads visible yet. So for that, as we are running on the back end, we could actually go to back end directly and just ask it. So let's ask from back end some leads. So new leads, back end, uh, get leads. And for each lead, what should we do? We should put those on the screen. So we could do a new button here. Uh, navigation button. And we should call that, let's say, lead title. And just add this to our group, our uh, layout. Add component button. So this can be fully dynamic, this, this UI. So now we have a bunch of buttons on the screen. And these also work in, in a such way that I, when I click something, it actually animates and navigates inside. So we should be showing that description of the lead in there. So let's add that as well. So we could create a new view here. A navigation view. And for that view, we could add, let's say, this is a lead called title. And also, we should show some kind of label inside here, new label with the contents of the, of the lead, something like this. What I'm missing here. Oh, wrong label. Sorry. Could we get rid of AVT already because it's 
disturbing is always auto-completing. So now we should be having kind of navigation to a lead view, and we also should be putting some uh, content in there. So let's take this one away and say view set content. Uh, like this. Oh, the problem was that I uh, didn't navigate actually to the view, so let's navigate to the view. Yeah. And here as well. No? Thank you. You know, this is pair programming. So now we can navigate the view. Okay, it shows HTML, so we could kind of fix that one. Uh, our label, just say label content mode HTML. And now we see like real HTML labels here. Okay, that was one part. So we can kind of generate UIs quite easily. But as you show, I actually have backend in here. So I didn't start from scratch. So let's take a look of the backend side. So my approach is actually made in two, three parts. This is just a multimodal Maven project. So I have this UI part where we actually started from scratch with one class. And I have also this backend side where I have like full uh, JPA layer with bunch of entities. These are just normal entities. So let's take one of these. And so it's like a lot of properties and, and tons of getters and setters and so forth. And I also have like small facade for this entity layer where I can ask like get all accounts or all leads. But this is just standard JPA, so we don't go in, in there. You can use any kind of backend you want to, whether that's like SQL or JPA or MongoDB or what have you there. Uh, the third model I have in here is a widget model. This is something that is not absolutely required, but as what in as I explained, Varni has those client-side widgets. And if you want to add more client-side widgets, you have to recompile those widgets from Java to JavaScript and put them in a widget set. So in this case, I'm actually using one of those add-on widgets for showing a graph uh, on the, on the uh, status view. So I added one of those widgets here and I recompiled it once. And I just kind of isolated the widget set on a separate project so I don't have to recompile it one again and again. Um, as you can see, now when I'm editing this, the kind of a workflow between the making a change and show, seeing that on the screen is really fast. If I would have this GWT compilation here, uh, that would take like one minute or so. Okay. Um, let's add one more thing. We've had uh, those entities on the screen. So in the user interface, we have this application. In the application, uh, we have left and right view. So let's put these on, on the screen first. I just create uh, some layout to put these in. Vertical layout. And put this one in the window. Say that it, it's a full size layout, taking all space and add this to my screen, this panel, left and right panel. So I should be having now two panels uh, set. Yeah, sorry about that. So I should be actually saying here. Almost there, but I don't see anything. Uh, new layout, let, setting that to screen, adding left and right to there. Should be okay. Strange. So let's do it in such a way that I show you it from the uh, 
from the project that they re started from. So let's see. Git. <coughs> yes. So now I just uh, pulled in my change it back here and I, I have the full application right here. So I, I'll explain from this application how we are doing this uh, connection to the backend. So if we go to account list view, this is actually the view that we are seeing here on, on the left side. So this is actually quite simple. What we are doing here is we are connecting to the JPA layer with this JPA container. So it basically kind of connects one UI component directly into the result set from JPA. So we are creating query, querying all the accounts from JPA layer in one line of code. And then we are just adding that uh, on, on the screen. So let's see where is my constructor. So there we are just saying for this table uh, set container data, data source accounts. So I'm basically just connecting this table on the screen to backend. So we could, let's say we comment these two lines out and refresh. So we have an empty table. So instead of that, let's add a data source like this, save. And now we have a table that shows all the entities from the JPA layer. And basically now I'm showing all the columns, so I just can hide a couple of columns with configuring this table. So this is how you connect into backend. So what else should I be showing from here? I'll show uh, the action listening code. So in this table, I'm just adding a click listener. So each time uh, some item gets clicked, I do something. And in this case, I actually navigate into a different view. And this is actually quite straightforward. You just listen for events and do something for those events on the server side. So we could say that, let's say, uh, get window show notification, item clicked, like this. So let's get back here and click. Actually, I don't have to even refresh as I'm kind of just modifying the code on the fly. Uh, one more thing is, is how we are building forms. This is actually quite straightforward as, as we are dynamically generating all those forms. We are, don't have to kind of write this down. So the forms themselves are using form component. So these are done in a such way that I just create a new form here, put it on the screen, and when somebody clicks this, uh, uh, or activates this, this form, we are setting a data source for it. Let's see. Uh, yeah. So we are basically uh, setting this form to edit this record. And for it, we are just saying set item data source. And we basically derive from this uh, data source what kind of properties it contains. We automatically create all the fields for it, all the editors, and we bind these back to JPA layer, and then we can commit and, and commit or discard this edited data back to this JPA layer. So you can do really many things like really out, in, in a really automatic way. Okay, one more thing. Uh, but the one, one more final thing here is how we are building this or integrating with add-on components. In this case, we have this 
animate the graph component here on the front page. And this is not a standard component in Vaadin. So I just kind of browse the directory, choose one component, and decide to integrate that. And it goes in two steps. So the first step to take this in is that we are adding a dependency to this. I'm using Maven here, so I'm just using Maven dependencies. So I put the dependency here in this widgeted project. Uh, this is, by the way, this is just an empty project with uh, POM file to kind of gra grab all those widgets together. So in here I just, I'm using one in touch kit naturally, but I'm also using this distribution bar add-on component from the directory. So I'm just basically cut and pasting from the directory these uh, five lines of XML here in this Maven project, and after that, Warden automatically downloads it, or Maven automatically downloads it from the repository, and then Warden compiles this uh, add-on graph component as a part of my project. And using that from the code side is just one line of code. So I have it here. So I'm creating this new distribution bar graph. So it's just one Java component. And then I'm just for looping through my sales pipeline stages and adding uh, new parts to this graph. So that's quite straightforward. So that was the iPad application. I'm not going through all the details as you can take a look at this yourself. Uh, so, oops. So the source code for all of this is online at GitHub. You could go to uh, github.com slash yojule slash serum demo and pull the whole project to your computer. It's basically just uh, Maven build and Teddy run and you can get it running. Or you can import it to your Eclipse and start editing it. But please experiment around with this project. So how does that really work behind the scenes? How does it, how is it done? Uh, when we are writing this code on the server side, let's we put, let's say, text field and a button on the, on the screen and add an event listening code in here. What happens? It goes in a such way that basically your browser downloads a bunch of HTML, and CSS, and JavaScript from Vardin from the server side. Uh, this is quite a pile of, of these, and these come built into the product. The good side of the story is that these get built, uh, compressed to maybe 120K, 200K, depending on how many widgets you are using. And this is a one-time download. So first time the user logs in or tries out this uh, application, it downloads the widgets, and then second time when he comes in, it's cached in his browser. So that bootstrapping code basically draws the components of the screen. And when you have the components on the screen, you can start interacting. So for example, I fill in some details, click a button. This basically sends an HR request back to the server side. And this HR request has the details that I have changed on the screen. Basically, button click and this uh, name that I wrote there. And that's just 150 bytes of, of code. So this is like really lightweight communications. It goes to your code on the server side. So basically now Warden routes all of this back to your event listening code on the server side. And here you are, for example, showing something on the screen, a notification. On the same goal, call, the result, or the re it returns a bit of JSON, in this case 500 bytes of JSON that describes that, hey, please show a notification on the screen. And then Warden widget that draws that notification on the screen. It should be noted that this is not HTML. It just kind of sh sends instructions on what, how to modify the components on the screen. So this is like terminal adapter in, in that sense. And basically all of those user interactions go back and forth. You can also sometimes say that, hey, I don't want to send this user, particular user interaction back and forth. It gets sent whenever the uh, application goes to server side anyways. So how to get started with this? Uh, 
First of all, you could go to var.com. There are plenty of demos that you can take a look of. Uh, easiest way of getting started is with Maven archetype. So you can just create a new empty project from archetype and then it generates a, a project that has like one button for your TouchKit application. Then you just pack it and run it. Uh, all of these are in the, in the slides, so you can copy the URLs from there. There is also a full book about this. It also has a chapter about one in TouchKit. Uh, we have a booth on, in the expo area with tons of these books, so you're gonna get a copy from there if you want to. It's also available online, so as a PDF. Uh, one way of getting started with Vardin uh, is a Dijon ref card. It's a really nice way of kind of showing how to build Hello World and understand the concepts in, in just a couple of pages. I think it's seven pages or so. And one, one thing that, it, uh, before going into questions, is that uh, we are actually arranging a meetup tonight here in the next hotel, next to Java One. So it's Hotel Serrano, 100 yards from, from Hilton. Uh, that's a kind of meetup for Vardin users and Google Web Toolkit users as well. So we try to kind of connect these users on the, on the Bay Area. We have really nice speakers, Craig Cromwell from Google, basically the lead of, of Google Web Toolkit. Mike Brock from Red Hat, lead of Arai project. Uh, I'm giving a presentation about how to build like hybrid client-server applications and how to do offline mode. Uh, there is some other case demos as, as well. So you are all welcome. Uh, there is a registration URL, so if you want to reserve your place in, in there. But do you have any questions about this? Yes. It does, it does, yes. Uh, this part of the application, I just uh, put two panels side by side, so it looks a bit small, but if you just put one panel, one navigation manager on the screen, it looks just fine on I iPhone. Yes? Uh, do you have performance benchmarks compared to HTML5 and the uh, We don't. Uh, this is actually built on top of HTML5, so all the rendering, all the code you see is just HTML5 and JavaScript. Uh, the trick here is that we have been using a lot of time in optimizing how it gets rendered. So basically in different iOS versions, different things get hardware accelerated, and we have kind of tried to really hard to make everything hardware accelerated in, in those. But of course, if you want to build the best user experience, you should go native with native applications. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, TouchKit is HCPL licensed, so it's free for free projects, but it costs a couple of hundred bucks for uh, for commercial projects. Uh, that said, uh, actually all of the UI components in Vardin work in iPad, so you don't really need TouchKit in order to build uh, iPad application, but if you want it to look like really nice on iPads, then TouchKit is a really nice component for that. Sorry? To run it. Is there an easy way to adapt this application to run on Guy? Google App Engine? Uh, to run on, on what? So, sorry, I didn't hear you. Google App Engine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This actually run on Google App Engine. So there is uh, built-in support for Google App Engine. Yeah, but you try to run or uh, try many times. Have to adapt some libraries. Yeah, that, that's uh, actually uh, one limitation. Google App Engine, it has a lot of limitations on what you can actually run in there. They are not like related to Vardin, but uh, you cannot put all kinds of libraries in the Google App Engine. But if you are li living within the limitations Google have set for the App Engine, Vardin itself and, and TouchKit itself is running on, on App Engine. Yeah? Is a container is a part of Vardin? Sorry? container is a custom component or part of Vardin? The J... Oh, JPA container, that's a, a one add-on component to Vardin. 
So uh, it's not part of the core library. Yeah, I would say so. The, the program model is really swing-like or desktop-like. So you're building with the same similar API. So if the team is already familiar with Swing and you have a code base on Swing, uh, it, the conversion should be quite straightforward. That said, you basically have to rewrite the UI layer because the components are the different. But because both are stateful applications in such sense that the UI state is preserved and, and it's it's more of a kind of desktop-like application than, than a web page. It should be quite straightforward. Are there any rich uh, tabular components or grid components like the grid, something that's customizable in a way? Uh, the, the table component itself is quite customizable. So it has like hierarchies and drag and drop and column uh, handling and, and so forth. So you should take that uh, look of that first. and and. Most probably you see all the features you are trying to find in there. Any other questions? Yeah? What's your release strategy as far as pushing out dates or enhancements? How often do you plan on this? Uh, we have, we touch it at, at the moment is in version 2. And the version 3 is coming out with 1 and 7 in, in, in a month or so. Uh, we have been releasing major version of TouchKit, um, I think a little more frequent than once a year. And then we are adding like minor releases with some minor extra features in, in there. So you should be expecting like yearly major releases and maybe one or two minor releases per year. And of course bug fix releases get, get released when, when we find bugs. Okay, thank you very much.